All right. Well, hey, you guys, I'm Lori Joyner and we're here at Connected Bible Study. And I have a talk today entitled Broken Promises. And so a story is told of a young boy who was acting up at school and the teacher called on him and asked him, do you remember what you promised me? And the boy said, yes, that I wouldn't misbehave anymore. Then the teacher asked, and do you remember what I promised you? And the boy responded, yes, that if I misbehaved again, I'd be sent to the principal's office. Then he said, but since I broke my promise, it's okay if you break yours too. Oh. <laughs> well, today we are addressing broken promises. And these broken promises are actually not as cute as my opening illustration. These broken promises devastate families and ruin our witness for Christ. Now, I have a confession to make. I've never actually spoken on either of the topics I'm talking about today. Okay, a lot of the speaking engagements and opportunities that I get with Lori Joyner Ministries are not about divorce or oaths and vows. Okay, a lot of times people contact me on my website and they say, oh, Lori, we want your, you know, treasure retreat or your blessed retreat or your untangled retreat. But nobody is asking me to come in and speak on divorce, you know. Uh, tell these women, you know, to keep their word. That's just not happening. And so this was a stretching experience for me um, to, to speak on this. And so it was a growing experience for me. And I hope that um, perhaps as we walk through this, it'll be a challenging growing experience for you as well. So let me pray and then we'll open the word and get started. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, just again, for our time together as women to uh, talk about your word discuss your word and uh, learn how we can more closely walk with you according to your word. And so Father, I pray that I would get out of the way and that your word would ring true and really be um, just the main teacher of our time today. And it's in Jesus name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, point number one, you can see on your outline is broken promises, divorce. And in Matthew 5, 31 through 32, Jesus will address this issue that, of course, was already talked about in the Old Testament. But I did a quick search on the top 10 most stressful life events. You've heard these before, you know, if you've moved, if you've done this. And so I wanted to see the list for myself. And uh, when they asked people to rank the top 10 things that was most stressful, number one was death. Okay. Okay death of a loved one. We could understand that. And number two was divorce as, as the second most stressful life event that a person could go through. Number three, job loss. You know, you're losing your career. Number four, a serious illness, a diagnosis that you just don't want to hear. Imprisonment uh, was number five, being incarcerated, obviously can really stress you out about it. Um, financial challenges. Uh, some of you have felt that stress before. Can't pay the credit card, losing a job, house is on the line. Number seven was relationship just issues, uh, changes in a relationship. Eight, exams and studying. We remember those days. Um, buying a house was number nine. Uh, number 10 was having a child. That can be a life altering uh, thing there, as joyous as it is, it can be stressful. But what I notice on the list is how sad and sobering it is that people felt it was less stressful to go to jail than it was to be divorced. Like they're like, I'd rather be incarcerated than be divorced. I mean, that is saying something or they'd rather be told they have cancer than deal with the stress of a divorce. So let's see what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 5, 31 through 32. And it says... It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. There's a lot there for us to unpack. But we need to understand this. A man in the Old Testament was generally, and here in the New Testament, was generally thought of to be righteous or good in matters of divorce if he gave his wife a statement 
of divorce. Okay, that's how he kind of cleared his name, is if he gave herself a little pink slip, if he gave her a little statement of divorce. So that's the first little uh, line on your um, outline there. Why? Well, she could at least prove that she was unmarried. Okay, this would allow her to defend herself against adultery if she was found with another man. She could be like, I'm, I'm not even with my original man anymore. Look, here, here, here's my certificate. Um, if she sought to marry, mar uh, marry somebody else, she could say, I'm not still in that other marriage. Or sadly, if she wanted to make her living as a prostitute, she could prove I'm not married any longer. So they believed as long as your wife had a pink slip, you were a good guy as you shoved her out the door and you could welcome in your new younger model. <laughs> and Jesus saw through this evil scheme. And he said, gentlemen, if you do this, you have broken the very law that you say you're adhering to. If you divorce someone, um, don't think of yourself all high and mighty. Like, look at me. I'm, uh, you know, adhering to the Ten Commandments. I gave her a pink slip. So, you know, my hands are clean. He said, no, if you do that, you are an adulterer and you're causing somebody else to commit adultery. So he is not letting them get away with this. Oh, she doesn't please me anymore. So now I'm going to have a new, a new one. But look, I covered my, my, covered my tracks here by giving her the pink slip, by giving her the certificate. No, he, he saw through that. So this is what the text states, and it is, it is true. But let's talk about this in a bigger picture, okay? I wanna talk about divorce and marriage. Just I wanna expand it just a little bit. God's intent in marriage is the union of one man and one woman, and that is to be a deeper bond than even that of a bond of a parent and a child, okay? And that's hard for us to even fathom. Because we know how strong our bond is with our children. And so God said in Genesis that this bond was more permanent, was more um, uh, deep than even that of a mother to a child. Because he will say the two will become one flesh, a permanent relationship. And I'm, of course, not making this up. Um, God's intent is stated clearly in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So, one flesh. So, Jesus will speak again to this exact same verse later in Matthew 19. Okay, so it says, some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? See, I want to trade in my young model for a new one. I want to trade in my old model for a new one. Can I just, you know, for any reason? And he said, haven't you read that at the beginning? So he's going to take it all the way back to creation order. Haven't you said that at the beginning, um, the creator made them male and female? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Then he goes on to say, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. And he goes further, therefore, what God joined together, let no one separate. God never wanted people to experience the pain of divorce. And I'm sorry if you are in this room list, or listening online, if you have felt the effects of this one way or the other. Okay, this is what makes this hard. Because I want to speak truth and what the Bible speaks, but I don't want to hurt the feelings of my people in here that have gone through that. And so that's what makes this challenging. That's why I'm glad we have pastors that <laughs> speak from churches and this doesn't have to be my main thing, but I'm still going to, you know, do my best here. But I know that there's a lot of pain involved. And can you just imagine, I mean, there's many issues, many areas in our life where, where we would love for it to be how God originally created it. I mean, this is just one of many, but, but let's just imagine for a moment if divorce wasn't even a thing, if it just, if it just wasn't a thing. I mean, people would still die, things like that. But what if it just wasn't a thing? What if people 
kept their marriage vows, even when it was like bitterly hard. Can you imagine the pain in our society that would not exist? I mean, it wouldn't be perfect because people are still sinful. The marriages wouldn't be, you know, always on the honeymoon. But divorce is so rampant in our culture that we have a hard time wrapping our mind around what it would even be like if it just didn't exist. Can you imagine everybody around the Christmas tree at Christmas? You know, not having to have two Christmases or three or four. I mean, can you imagine at high school graduations, there's zero stress because everybody gets along and everybody sits together and nobody has to sit on this side of the stadium and this side of the stadium. Everybody's willing to sit by each other. Can you imagine each grandkid's birthday not being overshadowed by who's there, who's not there? You know, who has ill feelings towards somebody else? Who got who, what gift, who's not talking to who? Can you imagine? We can't even imagine it. Can you imagine your wedding where there's no tension? There's no, you know, where's the step parents gonna sit and where's the step grandparents gonna sit? And you know, his parents are still married and your parents are still married, so nobody's avoiding people. There's no, there's no misinterpreted side glances, there's no competition. You just enjoy the day. See, I'm a child of parents who have been married four times each. I can tell you that I wish my parents would have stayed married. It wasn't a good marriage. It, 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 it had major pitfalls to it, okay? Major. But the bad marriage they had could not have been as awful as the roller coaster they put me on when they divorced. Many people believe the lie that the children will be better and happier if we divorce. And it's not always the case. Okay? It may bring short-term peace. It might. In the home, at that point. It may bring short-term peace to the kids' lives. You know, they don't have to listen to mom and dad fighting all the time. But it brings a lifetime of special days being dashed. Of tension over every holiday, every graduation, for their lives and the lives of their kids, and so on. Divorce harms members for life, no matter how much worse it would have been to stay together. It's really two very hard situations. Now, please note, in the case of abuse, I would not stay in the home. I would separate. I'm not saying an immediate divorce, but I'm saying a separation, okay? Now, I hope you would know me well enough that I wouldn't have to say that, but I can guarantee you, if I don't say it, somebody's gonna be like, well, what if somebody's getting hurt? So let me just state it then. If you're being physically abused, your children are being physically abused, then please remove yourself and seek help. And I will pray with you, but I'm not the professional in the room on that, okay? I'm not a professional counselor when it comes to marriage but what I can do is walk through it with you, pray for you, give you an encouraging shot in the arm as much as I possibly can. There are great men and women who this is their calling in life is to help Christian couples make it. And I know situations where there was physical abuse and look at them now, they, they can't even believe that's who they were. They're just as in love as they can and I can promise you they went through lots of counseling. I told the people at my table today that I've been in women's ministry for over 30 years. I've had countless, I'm talking countless women call me and want me to pray for their marriage. And in all of the situations, there was no physical abuse. There was no abandonment. My unbelieving husband just loved me. And there was no adultery. In every situation that I've personally been talked to, and asked for help. It's always been, I don't love him anymore. I found out he has a credit card that, you know, I, I didn't know he had. He's buying random stuff with it. Um, it it's, it's uh, he's 
a narcissist, he's toxic, you know, it's, it's something else. Uh, I, don't, I just don't love him. I probably shouldn't have married him. He was just like the last one around. So, you know, <laughs> I kid you not. That's, that has been said to me. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm really addressing the fact that divorce, even in our culture, is abused. Okay? It, I, I'm not even experiencing when people come to me that these really hard things like adultery, and uh, those exist. But the abuse when they're like, well, but this is happening and you know, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. There's one situation I know of where the husband is not moving up on in his job. He's not getting more money. He's not moving on in his career. This woman wants some money. Okay. And I'm like, you don't, you don't understand. Well, the problem you think you have right now, if you end up divorcing that person, the other problems well, you marry yourself a rich man. I promise you there'll be other problems. But not only that, Jesus says you're committing adultery if you do that. Okay? So what I would want to say to those women, now that I've studied this and I understand it better, if you divorce that person, are you willing to stay single for the rest of your life? Is he willing to stay single so that neither one of you commit adultery? Because you can have a pink slip all you want, but you are still one flesh. Now, I... Listen, I'm not an expert on this. I, I just read what I read and I studied what you guys studied. But I can't not say what Jesus said. It's a hard truth. Uh, trust me, when I thought about teaching through Sermon on the Mount, I literally did not think that I would be talking about this. I thought I'd be talking about being peacemakers and giving people mercy. Okay? <laughs> um, and so, um, but anyway, divorce is hurtful and destructive today as it was then. We can't look back and be like, it wasn't that bad then. It was just as bad. Okay, Jesus addresses it here. And really, when you think about it, at least death brings some closure. You know, when you're dealing with divorce, it's never over, ever, ever. It affects you and the kids and the grandkids for entire lifetimes. So no wonder it's number two on our stress list. For those of you that have gone through a divorce, I'm so sorry. I am not judging you. I have my own sin, regrets, and skeletons in my own closet. I have been to marriage counselors. I think everybody should go. Okay? Um, my first year of marriage was, wow, tough. And I found myself sitting in a counselor's office. And so I, I probably need a lot more. But there is healing in Christ in this area. Our church, I'm so thankful, has a divorce recovery group. And they, they, they realize that people are coming in wounded and broken and shattered, and they are there for them. And so I just love that. In your notes, I put divorcecare.org, a wonderful Christian organization. I looked at their statement of faith, and so I would encourage you to start there if you are dealing with the effects of a divorce. What you and I are called to do is to take our marriage vows very seriously. Yes, there are some days, I will tell you this, I will confess, there are some days where the only reason I'm still married is because at one point I stood up in front of 100, 200 people in front of God and said, I swear to God, I will stay with this person. There are days. There are days. That's it. And then there are other days where my, my man and I were planning on going on a 18-year uh, 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 cruise. We booked it with Susan, and he surprised me with it. And I'm like, I love you. <laughs> Let's go cruising for our anniversary. We've got to ride the roller coaster of marriage. And some days, some seasons, weeks, months, heck, years, are, might be just beyond you. And that's where we have the body of Christ and we have counselors and we have books and we have each other and we have the Lord and we have the Holy Spirit coming in and helping us and giving us the mind of Christ. We need to take our till death do us part really seriously because our culture abuses it. Other days, you're going to have a lot of reasons to be married and you're going to be so thankful that you stuck it out through those hard seasons. But either way, we've got to strive to be people of our word. If we promise till death do us part, then we need to strive to keep those words for better or for worse. God always intended lifelong marriage. That was his intent. He has always also, notice my transition here, intended integrity in speech. 
kingdom citizens are to tell the truth. So let's move on to broken promises when it comes to speech. In Matthew 5, 33 through 37, uh, we read in our study today um, that uh, we are not to do and take oaths and vows. Okay? We learned that Jesus says he wants our yes to be yes and our no to be no. Oaths were commonly used and commonly abused in Jesus' day. And they are today too. To promise to do something, people used an oath or a vow. Like, I swear by Jerusalem, I will sell you my two donkeys next week. Okay, that, that's what they were doing. Okay, religious teachers of the day had developed an elaborate stratification of oaths. Okay, they taught that, you know, by swearing by God's name was binding. But swearing by heaven and earth, things that he created, was not so binding. Okay? Swearing toward Jerusalem was binding. I swear towards Jerusalem, I'll sell you my wagon. But swearing by Jerusalem, eh, you know, maybe. It, it, it might work out that way. So the more closely an oath related to God or his name, the more binding it was. Uh, but you didn't have to be so particular about keeping vows in which God's name was not used. Like, I swear by my head. I swear, I swear by my right hand. I will be there. Okay? They just didn't feel like that. They felt like that was kind of harmless um, if you swore an oath by your head. So Jesus cut through, again, this religious leader's clever reasoning by saying his disciples, his kingdom citizens, should avoid them completely. Okay? His point was that people should not lie under any circumstance. One theologian said, by adding oaths to our statements, we either admit that our usual speech cannot be trusted or else we lower ourselves to the level of a lying world that follows the evil one. That's some serious stuff there. So if you need to shore up this area in your life, and perhaps we could all use some help and some reminders because nobody's perfect here. Let me give you a couple of ways to start. One of them is, this is super religious, ready? Don't be a flake. I, I really couldn't figure out any other word than the word flake. Because don't we all understand what I mean when I say don't be a flake? Like 200 years, people are going to be like, what's that word? <laughs> but right now we understand it. Okay? Kingdom citizens should not be flakes. If you commit to do something, you need to follow through. This is what Jesus is teaching. He's preaching this in the Sermon on the Mount. Your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be a flake. Do not break promises. Do not stand people up. Do not ghost people or keep them waiting. If you say you will do something or be somewhere, or pray for someone, or work a booth, or cover a shift, or drop something off, or mail something, keep your word. Okay? One of the ways the world will see Jesus Christ in us will be through consistent displays of truthfulness. I mean, if we can't be women of our word, our witness is just shot. If we trip up here, we're never going to gain the respect of our culture. Jesus wants us to be different. Now, I don't know if there's anything in our culture that is despised more than dishonesty from people who claim to be Christians. Is there anything despised more than a religious person saying one thing and doing another? Don't you think hypocrisy is the main thing that's held against us? Of course, we're, we're saying, listen, we're not even trying to be perfect. We know we can't without God, but they will hold it against us. And it starts with small things that lead to the bigger things. Okay, you and I can do irreparable damage to our witness and the cause of Christ by not being people of our word. This is a big deal. Look, it came right after divorce and lust and murder and anger. He's talking about your word. Further, you will hinder your own spiritual growth if you are a flake. Okay, listen, I have a passion to disciple women. I'm sure most of you know that. I love seeing the women that I'm discipling turn around and pick up a little gal in her nest and disciple that girl. Okay? It's like my, my, my grandchild in the discipleship chain. I love it. But I work with women that I cannot tell them, 
you should go disciple somebody. You should go and just go, go and get that started. Because I cannot trust that they will not flake out on that person. Because they're keeping me waiting. I'm looking at my watch like, where are they? I'm looking at the door of the coffee shop like, where are they? You know, where, where, where are they? I can't then tell them to turn around and disciple somebody else. But guess where we learn the most when we're the leader? Okay? You know, some of you that are leaders in here in this room, you're learning more because you're the leader. Right? Because you're the person sitting at the table that has to answer the hard questions. It forces you more to your knees and more in the word. We need to lift up and aspire to that. But nobody's going to challenge you to do that if you're flake. So you're hindering your own growth. Staying true to our word and what you commit to do actually opens doors for growth in Christ. In ministry and in your church. Listen, it's not just here with Connected Bible Study. It's not just discipleship. You're not going to be asked to even bring the donuts if you won't show up. You, you can't be trusted with any leadership. If you can't do some basic things like just commit to what you said you would do. So being a flake and not following through actually hinders your Christian growth. Okay. So number two, you need to follow through on what you commit to do. Reliability builds credibility. Just doing what you say makes you a more credible person. Others can count on you to follow through because you do what you say you're going to do. Again, Jesus is not teaching something new. I love this. This has already been talked about. This has already been taught in the Old Testament. But again, these religious leaders and these Pharisees have worked their way around and they're like, well, I don't have to keep my word if I say, you know, I swear by my head. You see what I'm saying? They, they, they are trying to attach things to their word so they can get out of it if they find something better to do. Okay? So, it was taught in Psalm 15. And that's a wonderful um, a group of verses there. I want you to read, you know, the whole thing at some point because it has a lot. Well, let me just read it real quick. It says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous. Here we are. Who speaks the truth from their heart. Whose tongue utters no slander does no wrong to neighbor, casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors, the, but, but honors those who fear the Lord. Here it is. Who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken wouldn't you like that? Your faith will not be shaken if you're a person like this. So just a couple of observations here. Did you see how many times speech or words is mentioned? It's a big deal. Notice that people who are near to God. Okay, let's look back at the beginning of that. Lord, who may dwell in the sacred tent and live on your holy mountain? Lord, who can be close to you? Who, who, who gets a close walk with you? It's the person who speaks truth, doesn't change their mind, keeps their oath even when it hurts. Those people not only get a close walk with God, but their, their faith is not shaken. Okay. Number two, a observation here is that a righteous one keeps their oath when it hurts. Do you keep your promises when it's inconvenient, when it hurts, when it costs you something? You know, even when you find something better to do, even when you're just having a lazy day, I just don't feel like getting up today. I don't feel like getting off the couch. I don't feel like keeping my word. When it's not convenient, when it means I've got to rearrange my schedule, when I would rather just stay on the couch. Listen, if I've given somebody my word, I, I will be hooked up to an IV machine at the hospital and I'm going to still try to get there. Okay? That is what we need to do. All right, I lay in bed at night looking through my messages on Messenger and, and, and text to make sure. I'm trying to double check that, that I, I'm like, did I forget anything? Did, did I tell somebody? I would text them later and I just haven't. I'm like, I'm setting alarms in my phone to remember things. I have three pages of alarms because I'm doing my best to keep my word every place I can. The other day, I was supposed to meet two gals that I disciple. They texted me, are you okay? They thought I'd been in a wreck. 
because I had the time wrong by 15 minutes. But they were like, Lori, you're, you're always here. You always beat us here. We thought, you, something is wrong, right? That's what it needs to be. I'm serious, my friends. That is how it needs to be. If you're not there, you're not, you know, keep, I'm not talking about five minutes, okay? I'm not trying to be legalistic, but they need to think something's wrong. <laughs> they, they need to think something has really happened. So be known to someone who doesn't need an oath to make people believe you're telling the truth. If I said, let's say to Gina here, Gina, I'm going to meet you three o'clock on Wednesday for coffee. I promise. But that must sound weird. I, I promise you, I'm going to meet you at Starbucks at three. I promise. She'd be like, what are you saying? That's weird. That only, those words only come from somebody who does not keep their word. Because it's like a double positive. It just doesn't need, need to be there. If you are having to really, really, really convince somebody you'll be there, the problem exists in your life. And don't be a flake. Okay, listen, I know I'm hammering that down because you know what? Some of you, people around you think you're a flake and they're not saying it to your face because they don't want to hurt your feelings. A am I right? Yes. Okay, so I I'm just going to be everybody's parent, okay? Or, or best friend or bestie. There's people in your life that might think you're a flake and they're not going to say it to your face. And listen, if you ask them, they're, they're going to be like, well, well, you know, you always, you know, you're always, you know, you got the kids, uh, you, you know, you got these migraines or whatever it is. I'm not trying to make light of migraines, but they'll help you make an excuse for yourself because they don't want to lose the friendship. Okay. Oh, some vows were common, but Jesus's followers were not to use them. We are not to use them. A kingdom citizen, Jesus taught that their word alone should be enough. And no one's perfect in this area. But at least we need to take a break on our journey with Christ right here and think about our words, think about our speech, think about our promises so that we can be a useful vessel in his hand. All right, my friends, we've been journeying through the Sermon on the Mount. We've covered some really tough topics, okay? We've covered anger. We've covered lust. Today, divorce and words. Next week, it doesn't get any easier. I can't pull the foot off the pedal quite yet because next week it's not retaliating against evil people and loving your enemies. Okay, so we've got at least another challenging week. And so we need the Lord personally and in this study. So let me pray to close us. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for entrusting us to speak your word. And, and Lord, I just... I just pray that you would use your word in people's lives. And anything that just wasn't of you, Lord, I just I pray that people would forget. And anything that was of you, Lord, I pray that you would change our lives with it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.